I come in and I tell her, Mom, why are we so different? We went to church on a Saturday. Nobody on the block went to church on Saturday. They all went to church on Sunday. Everybody on the block put their little Christmas lights on the house. We didn't. I stayed behind her. I kept insisting, Mom, and she wouldn't answer me directly until finally I just kind of like got frustrated at no answer. And I stomped my little six-year-old foot and I said, Mom, tell me. And she turns around, she looks down at me and she says, because I'm Jewish. And she walked out of the, uh, out of the kitchen and left me standing there. Hey guys, we got an amazing podcast coming up for you. But first, I just wanted to say thank you to this week's sponsor, our friends over at Elite Israel Realty. They do an amazing job finding new Olim, apartments and houses to buy here in Beit Shemesh. So if you're moving to Eretz Yisrael, they're the people you want to call. You can trust them. And we're going to hear a little bit from them a little later on in today's episode. I also want to say thank you to my personal friend, Svi Garber, over at Achtus Magazine. They're big supporters of us over here at Homebound. Achtus Magazine is the official Jewish community magazine of Tom's River. I'm personally from Tom's River. That's where I made my Aliyah from. An amazing community there. Definitely check out Achtus Magazine if you're in or around Tom's River. Check them out at achtusnews.com. And lastly, I want to give a huge thank you to Tamar. She runs our social media here at Homebound. She is fantastic at what she does. If anyone's looking for somebody to run their social media for their company or needs any writing done for them, script writing, uh, that's what she does. She's amazing. Check out her website over at talesof.com. And now let's get back to today's episode. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Homebound Podcast, where we talk about Eretz Yisrael and the beauty of our home. Today, I am very privileged to be allowed into the house of Yochanan Kastejanos. <laughs> very good. <laughs> and, um, and we're privileged to have him on our podcast today, Baruch Hashem. Yochanan has a particularly interesting story. Because Yechanan was not always Jewish, or possibly, we'll find out very soon about that story. Stay tuned. Um, Yechanan was a pastor, a Christian pastor, and now he is a holy Jew living in the Holy Land, Bar Hashem. We are privileged to have him part of our nation. Um, so let's get started. Yechanan, thank you for being on my podcast and letting me into your house. Thank you for inviting me, Michael. It was a pleasure for me. It's an exciting moment uh, as I see you uh, blossoming in, uh, many, on many levels. I've known you for a, a few months uh, at Shul in your learning, and uh, I'm excited to see you growing also uh, outside the doors of our Beit Midrash. Yaichan and I, we learned to get, we learned in the same kolel right. morning shul situation. Um, okay, amazing. So Yaichan and let's get started. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your story, how you got from pastor to right. to Jew in Eretz Yisrael? Tell us a little bit about the, the background. Sure. Um, since you you kind of uh, prepared the audience for uh, uh, by hinting that. Uh, was I or was uh, always Jewish or maybe not, you know, you be the judge kind of question. I want to make sure they stay tuned. <laughs> right. <laughs> You're very good. Uh, so I'll start there, uh, yeah. if you don't mind. Um, and, and I'll start by describing that the the uh, uh, that I grew up in a Christian uh, uh, home um, and our uh, denomination uh, known as uh, the Church of God Seventh Day, uh, has or had at that time um, a, a lot of common beliefs the, uh, with uh, Judaism. We didn't know that at the time. We just thought that we were practicing a, a form of, uh, of Christianity that to us was truth when compared to other uh, forms of Christianity. 
What were those uh, points? Uh, for example, uh, we went to church on, on what is called a Shabbat for us, a Saturday for them, for that uh, denomination. And uh, this was the way that we, we went, uh, we lived our lives. And uh, we also uh, did not uh, eat any uh, unclean meats as uh, brought uh, in Leviticus uh, chapter 11, I believe. Um, and, and although we didn't keep uh, kosher, uh, rabbinically kosher, but we uh, observed the difference between eating something that was clean and unclean. We also did not uh, celebrate any of the pagan holidays. And, and this is where things kind of uh, climaxed one, one year for us. All, all along on December, the uh, season that makes everybody jolly and happy, uh, well, our parents, especially on December 25th, we were forbidden from stepping outside the house because all the kids would be sporting their new little bicycles, little red wagons, or whatever Santa Claus had bought brought them that year. And uh, my parents didn't want us to to uh, be exposed to that because we didn't have anything to, Almost to like show. Almost like a good Jewish family. <laughs> Almost like that, you would think, right? And, and uh, but going back to school after the that winter holiday was always uh, a challenge because the kids invariably would ask, "What did Santa Claus bring you uh, this year?" And that was the conversation uh, in, in the playground. And and so uh, they uh, some of my friends asked me, uh, uh, "What did Santa Claus bring you this year?" Well, my parents had taught me to that uh, the following: Santa Claus is of the devil. And that's what I had grown up with. So when the kids asked me on the playground, what did Santa Claus bring you this year? I told them, what do you mean? Santa Claus is of the devil. Yeah. And uh, that went over like a lead ball. And it got uh, some kids upset and says, you're of the devil. And, and so that uh, day after school, I remember uh, walking home and this thing, thought of, of a near lynching by the kids at the playground uh, I was on my mind and, and I walk into to our home and I asked um, I found my mother uh, washing dishes uh, that was a time when nobody had a dishwasher and uh, so she's washing dishes by hand that was a long time ago that was a long time ago Early all, 1800s. All, there are many of us that still do that <laughs> <laughs> um and so and she's washing dishes, and she, uh, I come in, and I tell her, Mom, why are we so different? You know, like I said, we went to church on, on, on uh, Saturday. Nobody on the block went to church on Saturday. They all went to church on Sunday. Everybody on the block put their little Christmas lights on the house, or uh, their little uh, Christmas tree. We didn't. That was weird to me because when you compared us to uh, the neighborhood, we stood out, but not in a very nice way. Um, so she didn't pay attention to me. In other words, she didn't turn around to address me. Uh, she just kind of played it off. She kind of made a joke about it and moved on to her next plate uh, to, to be washed. And I, I stayed behind her. I kept insisting, Mom, uh, and I, I'm asking her, why do we do this? Why do we uh, uh, do that? And she wouldn't answer me directly until finally I just kind of like and got frustrated at no answer. And, and I stopped my little six-year-old foot and I said, Mom, tell me. And she whirled around. I think by then I she had had enough. I had pushed her to the brink of like, I don't want this conversation. I've been keeping away from this conversation all my life. Uh, and she turns around, she looks down at me and she says, because I'm Jewish. And she walked out of the, uh, out of the kitchen and left me standing there. Wow. I, did, I had no clue what she meant. I didn't understand what Jewish was. And in retrospect, I'm did, thinking, did you have Jews? Where, where was this? This was this was in Texas, in San Antonio. Texas. And were there Jews in the neighborhood? Did you of were you familiar not. with? No, with the, uh, n not 
uh, revealed Jews, maybe hidden Jews. You, you didn't and, know much about Judaism at the moment. No, of course not. The only thing that we knew is that uh, the Jews that were in the in the New Testament. That's about all we knew about, or that I knew about Jews. What do I know at six years old? Yeah. And, and in retrospect, you know, I was I was thinking afterwards. Uh, I'm an adult when I'm having this flashback and this uh, recall, and I thought. Mom, why? I mean, my mom is not around anymore. Um, she she passed a few many years ago, and I I thought, well, Mom, why didn't you just tell me that's the church that you that we chose, and that's where we go, and that should be final. I mean, that's that's the logical explanation. But for her to tell me I'm Jewish, there had to be something more to it, and. Um, I began uh, to 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 wonder, as an adult, why it is that we uh, we came to where we're at as Jews. It, it uh, didn't make any sense unless something God a God factor is involved, and and there is such a God factor. The the events that lead us out of Christianity and into Judaism, uh, on some level, are very much like those of others that have very similar backgrounds, and that's not as important, in my opinion, as what Hashem promised His people, and you can find that word in Deuteronomy, the last chapters, the last chapter of Deuteronomy where Hashem is speaking to Moshe Rabbeinu and he's telling Moshe Rabbeinu that the people that have been brought out of Egypt that have been saved, that have been redeemed will not always keep to the Torah, they won't be observant, they won't be uh, looking for a relationship with Hashem, they will be at times very rebellious, at other times they will be very sinful, and he says, Hashem tells Moshe, as a result of that behavior, I am going to send this people to very far away places, and that's where they will live. But there, he says, they will be a blessing to those nations, to those governments where they, I will send them. And that's in effect what happened in our history. We got sent out. We were a, we have been a blessing to the nations. We have been a blessing to the governors where Hashem has opened doors for many of our people. But he also told Moshe Rabbeinu, and from wherever you're at, I will bring you back. And Michael, I'm just one of several to whom Hashem had made this promise and has brought me back. How? It's to the events that brought us out of uh, uh, out of Christianity. They they start with suffering going through a difficult family crisis where <clears throat> one of our uh, members of our family is in need of healing of a miracle. Actually, nothing short of a miracle would help him because there is no known cure even today for what ailed, ails him at, at the young age of maybe six months old, we discover that he has a, a degenerative disease. And we thought that we would be spending days and nights uh, in, the, in the hospital. But he's 21 years old today, thank God. And it's, very, it's been very difficult for he and his mother and father. And, but he, it was through that event and the the searching for a remedy, nay, a miracle, that uh, my wife starts praying to the God of Israel. And literally, 
uh, turning eastwardly, praying towards Israel at, the, at that time we were in Texas. And what, what made her decide to pray well, to the I, Jewish God as opposed to... I was telling you in, that many of our belief systems uh, had a lot of relationship with Yiddishkeit or Judaism, we just didn't know it. We just thought we were uh, a, a different form or flavor, albeit very strange flavor of Christianity <laughs> by comparison to other Christians. But to us, that was normal life. And and, and so to, to say the God of Israel was not abnormal for us, but she took it to a different level, like I said, to face eastward. We weren't accustomed to that. To and then she she but because desperate times call for desperate measures. You've heard that phrase, absolutely. And so that's probably what prompted her. We needed a miracle, and who would give us that miracle but the God of Israel, who was the God of miracles? And um, one day she finds herself. Um, uh, Looking in a podcast, um, uh, uh, it was a uh, land of Israel, if I'm not mistaken. It was on the Ruth Sheva. Uh, at that time, we're talking maybe about 2005. And during that time, Israel is going through a, a crisis of its own, and families are being evicted from Gush uh, Katif in the, what is now Aza or Gaza, as uh, we pronounce it in English. Um, but oh, she. Uh, one day I come home from from my office, um, and and I find her in front of the uh, monitor. She's watching news on the Rutsheva, um, and she was crying. And I, I asked her, "What's wrong?" And it was the the videos of uh, some of our Jewish brothers and sisters being f uh, physically taken out of their homes by the soldiers, by the IDF. Yeah, uh, they were being physically taken out of the homes. They were physically Torah scrolls were being brought out of our Bete Knesset, and um, they. She was crying. And I asked her, why? What's, what's wrong? And she said to me, I feel as if this is happening to me. Wow. And I thought, well, that was my reaction, but not for the reason that you're saying, wow. I thought, wow, my wife is losing it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> She's not well. We need to get therapy. Uh, you know, one thing is to empathize with someone that's going through suffering. But the, another thing altogether is like, what are you thinking, woman? You know, they're way on the other side of the world. We're here. We're okay. We've got our own set of problems. Yeah. What's wrong with you? Of course, I didn't say that but because I wanted to stay married at the same time. Right. So, uh, but I'm thinking all this. This is weird. This is not normal. And, but she began uh, because of uh, one day, because of this drama that's going on in Gush Katib, one day, a Christian uh, caller on the, uh, comes to the show, and he, uh, uh, the hosts at that time uh, are uh, Jeremy Gimbel and uh, uh, Ari Avramowitz. And they have this uh, interview, and all I remember of the interview, uh, because my wife told me about it, uh, is that the gentleman on the line said, you know why you're going through this crisis is because Israel has not accepted, and he said the J word, as your personal savior. And Jeremy Gimpel went ballistic on the guy and told him this and told him that. And the last phrase he used was, I will never believe in your false messiah. And that really raised the eyebrows of my wife. Because the Christian narrative states that at some time in, at the end of the redemptive process, which, by the way, all of us are looking for, the Goyim, the nations, and the Jews, we're all heading towards and wanting 
a new world, a redemption from what the status of the quo is today. Why would they say something totally contrary to what the Christian New Testament says? It didn't make sense because the Christian New Testament says they will believe at one point when this Messiah, their Messiah comes, it says that they will, he will be greeted by the elders uh, and they will ask him, what are those wounds that you have on your hands and your feet? And that he will answer them, I got these in my, uh, by my friends, my family. In other words, the dating, you know, recalling the whole gospel narrative of where he was crucified and who crucified him. And they will say something like, Oy vey! <laughs> and they will accept it. At least that's, I mean, I'm ad-libbing here. I'm putting a little drama into that. But that's the idea, that one day the Jews will believe. And to hear a Jew say, I will never believe in your false messiah, was raising some very hard questions. And uh, we began a three-month in-depth study to answer that question for ourselves. Why would he say that? Why would he go off on a world uh, video and, and on a world stage and say something like that? And we discovered... Have you never had experience with Jews denying Yashka or... Never. Our, our form of uh, Christianity, which... You had very came, little to do with Jews still at this point. No, nothing. Wow. No. And, and just to take a, a little step back, at this point you were a pastor? I, I was a pastor by then maybe about... Uh, 15 years in oh, wow. uh, serving uh, as a as a pastor I had my congregation and this came at a time when uh, you know God's calling God, uh, is never at a convenient time to the person that's being called because I was involved in my career I was developing the career I was involved with uh, networking with other uh, pastors and 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 uh, church leaders in the city uh, where I belong to in Central Texas um, and and uh, and yet here is something that is coming to challenge everything that I'm standing for and I believe and I thought I believed and furthermore that I thought could withstand the test of scrutiny right and it didn't right and uh -huh. wow and, 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 and during this time you were still leading a church I was still leading questioning the church. your own uh, uh, and and faith. learning and, and and I thought that okay um, Hashem is revealing this truth so that I can help the church members come out of this f falsehood and, and that was uh, uh, a coat that was two or three or four sizes larger than I could handle it was not meant for me to do that. Did it's any of it. your congregants at the church know your struggle, what you were going through, or you kept? They, it they started. Seat? They started noticing. Uh, my preaching took on a different format. Uh, I uh, I started uh, searching for content, preaching content from the Parsha Shavua, because I could no longer preach from the New Testament. I was no longer believing what I uh, had believed all my life. And so I was uh, downloading uh, Parsha Shavua from Aisha Torah at that time. Wow. And that's what I was giving over. So some of the more religious people were like, what's this new obsession with the Old Testament? They they could tell because uh, I uh, I was no longer this uh, fire and brimstone preacher that that I was known to be, and I um, the words that were coming out of my mouth whenever I would say and we know that Jesus saves really didn't f have that fire in them that passion, and people saw that I was not the same anymore, um, and um, when. One day, uh, while we were learning and uh, trying to find out what 
this new information to us was new. Uh, what was this all about? Um, uh, we came across a uh, on the internet. Let's call it a uh, um, a table for in table format. Uh, Three hundred and something uh, prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. And so we we took it upon ourselves to go over each one of, of them. And uh, we discovered that each one of the alleged prophecies that Jesus fulfilled were actually not fulfilled during his time. And uh, some were blatant misquotes from uh, that were taken from what is now our Tanakh or Torah blatantly uh, taken or, or stolen, uh, plagiarized, if you will. Um, and, and that, of course, was very daunting. And, and I kept coming up with, uh, with the rebuttals in my head out uh, verbally between my wife and I that uh, perhaps we were just wrong about this, uh, this uh, what we were uh, understanding. And... Uh, one day we deci I decided uh, to give a call to my uh, the school that I, of theology that I went to, and just ask people who uh, professors whom I knew that knew more than I, a and uh, I was still thinking that I have missed something. You're just young and, and you're not understanding things, don't you see? And uh, I spent about two hours with this uh, one professor, uh, and I heard him rebutting me, giving me rebuttals, almost verbatim of what I was giving over in our, my own private conversations. And um, when I questioned him on, on that, he said, well, John, and, and that's my English name, uh, he says, John, it's all a matter of faith. Mm, and the, I, the big words. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and he should never have said that because I said to him, Calvin, are you forgetting who you're talking to? <laughs> See, what? there was silence on the other end of the phone because he remembered he was talking to. By that time, I was not only a, uh, a, a growing uh, minister of the gospel and a pastor of a, of a thriving congregation, but I was also very much involved in the faith movement by now, the name it, claim it. I had people falling over in, 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 in our church as it's slain in the spirit. I had people speaking in what was called the, uh, the speaking in tongues. I was being called in the middle of the night to do exorcisms. You were waist deep into this stuff. Huh? Oh, I was. So I was. You weren't going to just settle with vague and to for answers. someone to tell me that has spent most of his uh, life teaching and not practicing. I was taken aback by that. What happens is that um, he tells me, we'll talk to uh, this uh, Jerry. He was at that time the uh, uh, theological uh, professor, the professor of theology. And uh, we never spoke on the phone, but uh, we emailed and he emailed me. Um, his, his email started like this. Um, I understand that you've been looking for me, and uh, I was fat. I was, it was great. Uh, I I told him everything that I could on, in the email. He sends back the email and he says, "Well, John, as as you are discovering, not everything is as cut and dry as we thought." So I I heard him uh, on a similar journey as I, but perhaps he was just further along than, and than, than I was. And he says to me, not every minister or pastor out there is uh, willing to, uh, uh, to say what you are saying today. And, and those that uh, are aware would rather keep it quiet. So he said, listen, 
For the sake of your career, uh, I would suggest to you just don't talk to any uh, buddy about what you're coming across, much less the church leaders. So it was more it was, it was more of like a job than it was a, a well, belief. He was telling, by then I was already uh, earning a, a, a pay, and he was just telling, don't rock the, ro- the boat, you know, just keep doing what you're doing. It sounds like there's a conversation that he may have had with other people too. That it's possible, get to a pro- or, or maybe he ha- was having, he had had the conversation with himself. Uh-huh. And he says, just let it be, keep your job. Yeah. Who cares? At the end of the day, it's not true anyway. And what uh, if you were going to benefit from it? Why not? Right. But I was not about that. You know, all along I've been believing that there's truth and that I've got to pursue truth and I've got to uh, stand up for truth. Wow. And that's how I became uh, a Jew. I came into, um, I remember uh, the first time that uh, I, I resigned, just to give you a little background. I didn't just walk out. I resigned formally uh, and uh, for about, a, um, I was very upset at God. I was very upset at God. I did not want anything to do with religion. Uh, wow. uh, because I, I thought, how dare God um, wave, keep the, the carrot dangling, and then there's nothing there to take it away. Um, at that point, you saw it less as discovering the truth and more of just being just betrayed by God, who should have been guiding you the whole time. He should have been guiding me, and I felt betrayed by God. You're right. And uh, to get back at God, I thought, well, okay, I am just going to become a, a JQ citizen. Uh, we're going to buy a boat. That's what I told my wife. We're going to buy a boat. And on the weekends, we're going to go boating and go fishing. Faith retirement. <laughs> oh, that, that's, that's what I was about, and, and the, uh, the, which was weird because I, I didn't know the first thing about boating. Didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> and fishing, I'm not a great fisherman unless I'm at the local uh, fish, fish market and buying my fish. But that... Uh, Anger or upset at God lasted about a week. Hey guys, we'll get right back to today's episode. First, we're just going to hear a couple of short words from our friends over at Elite Israel Realty, Rob and Donnie. We're so happy to be part of the Homebound podcast, such an important podcast, talking about Aliyah. We at Elite Israel Realty are here to help you through the process. Donnie, what are we going to do to make it easy for them? So through our, with our experience, with mine and Rob's experience that we've made Aliyah, we've bought homes of our own, and we've really learned how to keep the process as simple as possible, as close to the U.S. home purchasing process as, as possible. And that's what we do for you. We cater to the Anglo crowd from abroad, and uh, we're here to welcome you and, uh, and help you with uh, buying your home in Israel. Wow. Um, we got in the mail uh, a postcard, which was strange, still to this date, 10 years plus later. I don't know how that postcard from uh, a Chabad event in, in the same city came to us. I have no idea how it came to our mailbox. But it was an, an invitation to go see, uh, listen to a resident scholar from New York by the name of Angel Mark, uh, who was uh, going to be speaking during a pre-Pesach uh, lecture on the subject of conversos. And, and so we went. And um, my wife uh, asked me if I wanted to go, and I said, sure, why not? We don't have a boat yet, so... <laughs> <laughs> got nothing else to do. <laughs> we got nothing else to do, why not? Let's go. And, and we did. And that started our, our journey into what is now Orthodox Christianity. We went from... Um, we, we did visit the... What do you mean Orthodox I, Christianity? Well... Uh, we went to, uh, we l- looked at reform. We looked into uh, conservative uh, Judaism. Uh-huh. And, and because of who, our background as, as church leaders, as church teachers of, 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 uh, of Bible, we did our homework. We knew what questions to ask. We're interviewing, for example, one, one day the conservative uh, uh, rabbi 
uh, a big shul, gorgeous building. It's on the complex of the JCC there in 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 our in our city that was uh, uh, in central. That is in central. Huge complex. He gave us an hour of his time, and we're we're talking like you and I are talking right now. And we had the questions that we needed to ask, mainly about how he would apply Torah, what we understood to be Torah, how he applied it. And we were not satisfied with his... By the way, I just want to say that is by far the best way to find the truth in anything, is take the Torah and see who is who is speaking the ways of the Torah. Right. The most straightforward. Uh, and, and you know that's, the, that's always going to be the uh, truth. And, and, and what, what, what really sealed his fate in our eyes was um, when, he, when he tells us, my wife and I were both uh, present, he says to us, what would you say if I were to, what would, you, what would your reaction be if I were to say to you that last month I married two women here in our shul? And he was not laughing. He was not smiling. He was very, very serious and in a very professional tone. And I answered him in kind, in a very serious and professional tone. I said to him, Rabbi, I would say to you, this is not the place for us. You turned to your wife. You said, honey, get the boat. We're out of here. (laughs) I didn't think that far. I, mean, <laughs> I, I think the the whole boat thing was out the window. Oh, you done so it. I, 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 th- I think because because of what I told you, it, it was uh, Hashem was bringing us home. I didn't know, uh, but I was allowing him. Okay, you've got another corner for me to turn. I'm game. What's there around the corner? The rabbi flips through a Rolodex. You're too young to probably remember what a Rolodex, you've probably seen them on the videos. That's how that's how long ago this was. Uh, and he brings out this card, and it, and it was the Chabad uh, card. Ooh. And it gives me, I think this is what you're looking for. Every good Reform rabbi has Chabad cards for, <laughs> for those who don't accept <laughs> the Reform faith. <laughs> and, and so I call uh, Rabbi... Levertov, Joseph Levertov, and um, a shout out to the Levertov family. And uh, the uh, rabbi gets a call from me. It's, uh, I think, maybe Thursday, if not Friday. And uh, I start telling him a version of this story. You know, I I, I wasn't probably as articulate. You know, I'm kind of like maybe off uh, all over the map to telling him. And he's listening to me. And, and he invites me to uh, uh, Shabbat uh, services, that uh, Arab Shabbat. And, and then he, he says to me, but I can't count you. And I, I know now that he was talking about a minyan, right. uh, the 10 minimal uh, quorum that's needed. Uh, but at that time, he says to this goy, I can't count you. And I'm thinking, what on earth does that mean? And we showed up. We drove to shul. Um, and uh, I walk in and I'm with my wife. And there's two, two men uh, who... Uh, are are standing there, kind of smoozing, uh, and before services, and as I, my wife and I walk in, they, uh, one of them says to me, Psst, calls me over, Psst. and he goes like this, and I'm thinking like, man, I just got here and I'm I'm already getting rolled here, <laughs> <laughs> so I walk up to these two Jewish uh, guys and and they say. Uh, we understand that you want to convert. And I, I'm thinking like, who on earth told them anything? About CIA. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We've been watching you. <laughs> We've been listening. And and, uh, and then they start uh, telling me, um, they, uh, they're gonna, they have to refuse you three times, but you just stay with it. <laughs> And I'm thinking, defeats the purpose. <laughs> I'm thinking, I already knew that. I've yeah. done my homework, but inside, I'm thinking, you're not supposed to say that. Yeah. <laughs> Bless their hearts. Should have snitched them out to the Chabad rabbi. <laughs> and um, no wonder they have such a successful con- convert rate. <laughs> 
the rabbi, uh, uh, he, uh, uh, at, at the end of services, uh, sits us down and uh, we're talking with the rabbits and, and we're telling her the story. We're telling her over the story. She's listening to us. The rabbi, Rabbi Levertov, he, of course, playing it as a very indifferent and uninterested in these two goyish guy, people that are coming in to his shul. But he's still kind of wondering. He's curious. So every so often he comes into the room. He pretends like he's straightening out a, 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 a picture on the yeah. wall so the rebbitson tells tells us my michael why do you want to become jewish nobody likes us everybody wants to kill us and we didn't have an answer it just made sense to us that that was where we wanted to be we could no longer be uh, christians and and the other forms of judaism didn't just speak to us and, and therefore, eventually, uh, through a other set of events and processes, uh, we became Jewish, and we started davening there. For, I think we were we had we had already plans of of moving to uh, uh, to Israel, but it wasn't in the near future. It was somewhere there. Uh, I, I just didn't feel like I wanted to change my whole life that I had lived in the United States. Uh, I had a, a decent job. I was comfortable. Uh, I was enjoying the the new community there in in in, in the city um, with the Jew and the Jewish community. We were uh, learning, and but. Every time, Mikhail, what, what would happen is that every time that I went to, to, to pray and I would open my siddur and I would see that many of the, the blessings, many of the, the paragraphs of prayer involve either blessing Israel because that is the place that I want to be, I mean, that's the inference from what I was reading, or it's saying, and bless us because I'm already there. And both of which didn't ring true to me because that was not me. I, I was not thinking of being in Israel, and I certainly wasn't there at that time, and, and I felt like such a hypocrite. Um, and, and so that, uh, because again, we're about, truth the the idea that we want to be that we want to be truthful to ourselves starts coming jumping out from the pages of my siddur and i i again um just the way i resisted hashem and uh, i was re uh, all along the way i was still resisting hashem that he wanted me to move to israel and uh, eventually we were uh, made all the applications to come to Israel on Nefesh Benefesh and uh, the whole process. I this think, was right after you converted? Um, I would say about a year. They, they, asked every, uh, they asked everyone before they make Aliyah, to, especially converts, to, to be with the community for about a year. By then we had already been there as non-Jews for about a, a year, if not two. But as Jews, we needed to uh, uh, complete a full Jewish life cycle of all the Hagim, uh, Shabbatot. Makes and, sense, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and and of course, all the while, the uh, Jewish agency and Nefesh Peneshvish was working with our application and the uh, documents that were needed. And eventually, it was in De on December the, uh, of uh, the year 2008 and that I found myself on an airplane heading here by myself. Um, because my family uh, stayed stayed behind, my wife. Uh, by then, my children were already uh, grown adults, married, and on their own. And so it was just basically myself and my wife. And I came here to kind of like be this point man to uh, set things up. And uh, uh, and then eventually, uh, year, uh, about two years later, she would join me. And uh, this is where we've lived ever since. 
Uh, you were here for two years uh, while by, your wife was in America. By myself. She would come visit uh, uh, Hagim, she, uh, or sometimes I would go back to the America to, to visit. Uh, wow. That's uh, how we maintained our, our uh, uh, marital ties. And uh, eventually we would move uh, to an apartment uh, outside uh, um, the old city. I say that because uh, when I lived uh, here by myself, I was living in in a, a, a yeshiva dorm of um, uh, there in the old city, and, and so uh, eventually we uh, we would move to Katamon in the neighborhood of Katamon, and there we would spend about two years, uh, where the rest of my family would join us, my my daughter, her family, and. Uh, and then we would eventually move uh, from uh, Yerushalayim to uh, Bet Shemesh. And we've been in Bet Shemesh uh, for the last, I would say, close to 15, uh, a little over 15 years, if not, uh, uh, if not more. So when, when you, as you converted to Judaism, uh, while you're in the middle of that process, did it take, how long would you say it took for you to realize that Eretz Yisrael is... It can't be even. It's it, it's the only place to be a Jew. How long did that take for you to to realize, or did it not, or was it instantaneous? With, yeah, I think along it with, was. Uh, if I'm striving for the truth, Eretz Yisrael is the place to be as a Jew. I think that I think that's what it was. I I, I don't remember struggling with the with the concept. Uh, it was more like, how do I get the 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 land of Israel and this new Jew together? How is that going to happen? It wasn't a, a, a when would it happen so much as it was how am I going to make this happen? Now? Right. What's going to have to change inside of me? And it was interesting because I knew that I was carrying with me a lot of baggage and not very pleasant baggage uh, uh, with me. And one of the things that I remember that was a challenge to me is I, I, because of uh, my background as a preacher, we always would preach fire and brimstone from the Navim from the prophets and the prophets would say and this land will smell you out Ooh. and if you don't smell good it'll spit you out and and here i come with all this baggage and a and lot that, of deodorant oh, <laughs> <laughs> and i'm thinking what's gonna be of me you know the land's gonna find me and it's gonna say you don't belong here little jew man and uh wow. i had so i had a lot of work on myself to do well, I, I had to do a lot of work on myself. Yeah, what, what you're saying is, is, is something I find that when I made my aliyah, one of the first things I noticed is I was made, meeting so many Geirim converts. And, and I realized that, you know, I think for converts, it's actually much easier to move to Israel. Because like you're saying, when you convert to Judaism, you're not coming with any baggage of politics in Eretz Yisrael or mitzvah, not a mitzvah, my rov, not rov. It's, it's just, it's just yeah, if I'm can... giving up everything in my life to serve Hashem and to, and to find the truth, you know, like one of the first things you'll notice, like you said, is just, it's just Eretz Yisrael is everywhere. So I ha it's, you know, it's hard to really imagine, like, if I'm looking for the truth and I'm, and I'm you know, and I'm, I'm willing to give up everything for, to do the right thing, it's hard to, it's hard to take Eretz Yisrael out of them. No, that's not important, you know. And, and, and um, how was your? How, how do I feel about this? Was she on the same page, or did she need some convincing? I, I think I think I was the one that was not on the same page. Uh, and she was the one praying to Yerushalayim she way back the, when. Oh yes, yeah. she, she's the one that was like most of the Jewish women. They're the ones like we were told in our Torah that it was the Jewish women back then that were telling their husbands, "This is what we've got to do." You know, when we're talking about them in in Egypt. They're the ones that were at the forefront of that major dramatic move that prompted their husbands to uh, uh, to move also, and, and and it happened with us uh, that it was uh, she was on board with the with the whole concept. Uh, um, uh, I think she was just waiting for me to catch up. Wow! And it it just takes some some men. It takes us a while, but once we're here, you know, um, I think I. I think I mentioned to you the story uh, I said at the beginning that story about my mother. Do you know that uh, something I didn't tell you is that that recall didn't happen until I was here in Israel. 
that we're talking about. I'm at the age. This happened to me at the age of six. I am here at the age of probably late 40s, early 50s. And because I'm working on myself and I am asking Hashem to allow me to stay. And at the same time, I'm wondering, why did I make this so un, so crazy of a move to turn your world upside down, not only as from where you were as a believer, uh, but also where you're at as a person, uh, uh, where, uh, where you were living you've gone com- uh, completely to to the opposites of what you thought you were going to grow up to and uh, to be and retire as so i was looking for a logical answer and uh, a reason and hashem brought that recall back of wow. that story and 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 then i understood and you think eretz israel woke up that memory in you uh I don't know if it was so much Eretz Israel as much as it was Hashem's promise. From wherever you're at, I will bring you to me. I will bring you back. Well, you said you, you remember that when you got to Eretz Israel. Is that yes. That's, uh, that's when that recall came back. Was there something you saw that you felt that? Was it just seeing all the Jews? What, what, what? No. Just one day, uh, as I've done all, uh, doing all this work on myself, that memory came back and it made sense at that moment that if my mother is was jewish i was jewish all her offspring are jewish and it stands to reason that that's where i needed to be i needed to become a jew and eventually i needed to be back in israel because that's what Hashem's promise was. From wherever you're at, from there, I will bring you back. And, and our journey as as both a uh, as a people uh, took us from the expulsion in Portugal and Spain and for in the 1400s to Latin America, and and uh, <laughs> the Jewish agency a few years back. Uh, did a study and they came up with a number and did a study on 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 uh, the jewish uh descendants within hispanics and they came up with a number and you know what that number came up to be they say that there are 67 million uh hispanics that have jewish ancestry wow wow so there, uh, there Hispanics. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there wow. there are a lot of us. There are a lot of us out there that are going to go through this same wow. journey. And have any of your uh, children followed your ways to Judaism and Eretz Israel? You know, when we told them uh, of our decision to leave, leave Christianity, uh, they were already adults. Um, my son said something <laughs> that that he was he he has been true to his uh to his beliefs and he said to me you know dad i never really believed in that <laughs> <laughs> so he was just uh playing along to get along <laughs> and, and so to him it was probably a relief um uh, i never had that kind of a discussion with our daughter so i don't know where they were holding um but uh all we asked them, our children was when we made the family announcement, uh, we told them, um, we just want you, whatever you do with your lives, we want it to be both moral and legal. Other than that, you're on your own, basically, is what, you, what we told them. Um, they eventually converted as well. Beautiful. On wow. their own. And and have any of them joined you here in the? Uh, um, there are two two of them. My oldest uh, is has been with us, and my youngest wow. uh, with with their families. Uh, they uh, one of them, my youngest, and her uh, husband uh, completed their conversion in in Texas. My son completed his conversion here, and all on their own. My daughter, the one that uh, is still in in Texas, uh, she converted uh, in in Texas as well. 
but they're all uh, practicing Jews, uh, Orthodox Jews, from Jews. That's unbelievable. That's it's an amazing shame. journey. It's wow. an amazing journey. Wow. And it's not over. There, because once, once we, we become Jews and we connect with Torah, uh, not only is the Torah cleansing us as, it, as well as it should, because it's, uh, it has that job to, to correct us, to repair us from whatever has been. Uh, and, but once we're in that state of, uh, of cleanliness and, and we are able to see our role at, in the world, on the world stage, and, and that's where uh, where I'm at right now. I, I'm 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 tasting what the role of a Jew is in the world for me. What this Jew's role in the world could be, and what I have discovered along the way is, along the way is that Hashem has always put different people or different events along the way to as a as a roadmap. And even though uh, I had trouble understanding, uh, I didn't burn any bridges. I kept contact with some of those individuals that I met along the way, both rabbis and Jews and non-Jews. Along the way, I met uh, uh, two individuals that are Noahides with whom I kept close contact for a while we lost contact for a number of years we came back after October 7 and it was at this table at this Shabbat table that I'm speaking to one of those who uh, at this Shabbat table it was Larry Bontrager and then October uh, 7th had already happened here in Israel and we're talking about the the crisis, economic crisis that uh, the construction industry is going through and the farming industry is going through. And next thing we know, we're kind of looking at each other because of his farming background. Wouldn't it be amazing? Wouldn't it be ideal if we could get no heights to come and replace? That would, that would change. The Palestinian workers? It would change the world. It would change... That would be the most amazing thing. And we looked at each other. Yes, why not? Let's do that. And from there uh, was born the uh, Noahide Initiative Phase 1, which involves creating a, a place in Israel whereby uh, people that are friendly, we're calling them Noahides because that's what uh, is in vogue right now. We don't have to have that word. What we do have to have is a person, a man or a woman that is committed to God in, and his Torah, that is committed to the Jewish people to uh, by way of friendship, by way of of providing a safe place for them by way of, of of not bringing any danger to us physically or spiritually because let's face it even though there are alternative uh, people out there as as foreign workers whereas they may not want to kill us but their impurities because of their belief systems they bring that to Eretz Israel, and like I told you earlier, Eretz, I'm a, Eretz Israel is a living, breathing organism. It can smell it out, yeah. and and it doesn't like the idea that we bring what uh, Judaism uh, we call it tuma impurities, and avodazara idolatry in any of its forms, whether it be Christianity or any other or uh, Eastern or even Islam is a form of, of avodazara, of idolatry. And it brings impurity not only to the land, but to our people as well. Because uh, anytime we engage with them uh, in commerce, yeah, or there is a relationship that is built and the, the closer that you are with people that w want to kill you the more danger there is obviously but the closer that you are with people that believe different 
believe from you and that want to impose those beliefs on you because they believe that they, that they have the truth, the more danger there is to those that don't understand that there is no other truth except the Torah. And there is no other God except the God that manifested, that revealed himself to Avraham Avinu and all of our forefathers. Well, so you started an initiative to attempt to bring in no hides. That's right. And replace the Arab workers. And with... not only not only the Arab workers, but uh, recently the uh, government uh, has... Uh, capitulated to the pressures of uh, within and without that uh, say to them, okay, just bring in workers. You know, uh, there are statistics. One of our, uh, one of our consultants, which is a, uh, an engineer, uh, we have a small organization started. Uh, he told us that, uh, that, that the, the vacuum uh, that the Palestinian Arab workers um, left was in the 80,000 workers just in the in the uh, construction industry alone and that's why recently you've noticed that uh, like in the last after October 7th uh, construction uh, work came to a standstill yeah absolutely and I've I've been talking to uh, Kablanim which is a, a construction uh, Couple of name uh, construction foremans or people in in construction contractors builders, contractors. Yeah. There you go. That's the that's the word for it. Uh, they've told me that uh, their jobs have come to a complete standstill because they can't find workers. Right, and they're going to bring the Arabs back if they don't have anyone else. And they, and they say to me, uh, these two consultants. We have two consultants that are both engineers, construction engineers that have been in business for a long time, and and there there are advisors in that area. Uh, and they said it, it would be a, a waste, a waste, a total uh, waste of, of of resources if we were to bring them back. And they start to tell us why uh, that's not uh, uh, feasible from a from a purely professional level. Uh, 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 it's not feasible. And when you talk about others from other countries, it's not feasible as well because their level. Of, uh, of knowledge or experience in construction does not come to the level that is needed here in, in, in Israel to just build a home like this. Uh, they don't have that background. Uh, right now, we're interestingly, uh, is the, the, when, when I heard that, I, 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 rec I remember that uh, because of my uh, my Hispanic background, and I visited Mexico, uh, and and uh, I remember that the first time that I came here, I told my wife, "You're gonna," I should say, my wife, uh, her family are, are from Mexico, uh, and and I told her, "You're gonna love Israel. It reminded me so much of Mexico." <laughs> <laughs> so at, at the time, I was thinking, you know, people walking on the streets, the 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 uh, the public transportation. It was also so so much like Mexico, but also the buildings. All the buildings in Mexico are made of brick of uh like uh, gavis as we called what is gavis uh the uh sheet rock i'm not oh the wrong word uh they're made of uh cement board cement board this kind of uh construction that's exactly how uh buildings are are built in not only mexico but i discovered argentina uh colombia and it takes a little little bit of a higher level of worksmanship to be able to construct and, and uh, what, a building here than it would in and uh, what I have also discovered is that uh, the the economies in, in these uh, countries uh, are, are lend themselves to to uh, to be able to consider for a man to consider moving temporarily to Israel to provide this workmanship and and, and provide for himself and for his country of origin some income. 
because both benefit from what uh, foreign workers can send back home to their families, and certainly that helps the economy. And like I said, the economies in uh, in many of the uh, Latin American countries have tanked. They are hitting a rock bottom on on many levels. So if you can get the right workers into this country, we can be safer. We it would help us immensely, and it would help a lot of countries out there that would gladly have you know people would gladly come here to be able to provide for their families to have good work safe work and it would also be uh, uh, allowing the jewish people to fulfill their role uh, on the world stage uh, uh, what i would uh, refer to as the, be part of the redemptive process yeah. and what is that to promote the awareness global awareness of the seven universal laws Wow, so much good would come of this. Now, uh, for our audience, is there any way to be involved, any way to help out, any place where they can donate or be part of this? We are in the process uh, of uh, creating a website. I am not prepared yet to to give that, and that's unfortunate. Um, and uh, but within the next forty eight hours, we will have that up and rolling. Uh, we have to because we're going to be meeting uh, on the phone with uh, uh, personnel from the uh, newly uh, nominated uh, uh, ambassador from Argentina to Israel. And so this meeting will take place. We love him. (laughs) (laughs) And he loves us. (laughs) Okay, so great. By the time we release this podcast... And maybe we can... uh, Hopefully you have a website. Yes. And if it is, it'll be... We'll put it right here. And yes, that would be amazing. Uh, uh, President uh, Millet loves Israel, loves Judaism, and uh, I think that uh, that is a, an open door for this initiative to to at least uh, get its foot in, in there and and make people aware of, of of the alternative to what they've been living. That's amazing. And uh, just before we end off. Um, for for those Jews out there who are on the fence, contemplating Eretz Yisrael difficulties, yes, no, this is a podcast. We're based around Eretz Yisrael. We want to spread more more information about Eretz Yisrael. What would you say? Maybe you have some some. You seem like a pretty wise man <laughs> who's been through a lot. And uh, do you have any any advice for? You know, somebody who's searching out the truth and trying to figure out if this is the right thing. You know, it's ironic that uh, you're asking me that because uh, the uh, the week before I left, I asked my then rabbi uh, the same question. What advice do you have for me? I'm about to move to the other side of the world. And so I'm, uh, I'm looking for uh, like this very wise, deep, maybe even Torah dick uh, uh, advice that he's going to bring out some, some kind of like, uh, uh, I don't know, a Torah, Talmud or something, maybe even Kabbalah and tell me this is what you need. The most profound secrets. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, and, and we're walking uh, back from, uh, from Mincha through, through, uh, through the parking lot. Uh, and he says to me, um, you just got to be aware of the bureaucracy in Israel. If you can do that, everything's, everything will be fine. And I thought at the time, that's it? <laughs> that's it? That's all you got for me? <laughs> But once I got here and I became part of the the life of uh, of, a, of an Israeli citizen, I understood what he meant. Um, uh, for especially for those of us with a Western mentality, American mentality, um, we have a, a, a different idea of how the government works, and, and and it's usually works for us, not we for them. Uh, it appears here that w- the system as because it, it, it's not a it's a system based on English law and English practice from uh, and therefore for those of us that are coming from America it's very difficult to understand even sometimes accept but if you can 
jump those hurdles, uh, it's worth it uh, to to live among your people. The just the every time that I am getting ready for Shabbat or a hug, like we are in a few a uh, few more weeks, uh, a couple of more weeks, uh, uh, Pesach. Uh, but every every Shabbat. And I go out to to do the shopping, and I'm going through the 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 center of town, the mercas as we call it, and I'm seeing the boys, the girls, the moms, the dads, the grandpas, the grandmas, and we're all just doing the same thing at the same time, and it's crazy. But I'm thinking. We're giving joy to Hashem as His children are preparing to usher in another Shabbat. Yeah. And there's no other place I'd rather be. With all its warts and all its unpleasantness. Bureaucracies. This is, there's no other place I'd rather be. Absolutely. I'll just end off with one thing and then we'll, we'll finish up. Um, when I, when I, had my first visit to Eretz Yisrael after I was married already. You know, uh, my wife and I, we came here for Sukkot and we were here for two weeks. And when we came back, you know, I, I, I thought I'd have some spiritual experience and I'd be on such a high. And the truth is I got sick on the plane like a lot of people do. <laughs> and I didn't really have a great time because I wasn't feeling good. And, and you know, um, but the one thing that I came back with that I felt stuck out to me the most was exactly what you just said. It was Erev Sukkot at the Mirkaz. And just seeing the the little of an asterisk stands and the people, the hustle bustle, and unlike America, you know, people here don't necessarily use their cars for everything or don't have cars, and people are pushing wagons and strollers and <laughs> hand trucks, whatever they can to get their groceries home. And, and I was looking around and I was like, wow, uh, and this just seems on so the good. bus for, with everything that they bought that <laughs> afternoon, and then there's still room for more. Yeah, and there was something about that 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 just old school. Judaism of just the simple things. It was just, right. it was just so few people on their phones and busy with. It was just preparing for Yom Tov. Just Jews everywhere doing the same thing. And and right. and to me that 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 spoke more than anything. Um, so thank you, Yechanan, for for joining us today. It's been a um, pleasure. On the Home Bad Podcast. I, I, I enjoyed it. I I enjoyed your presentation as well. <laughs> the way you handle this is is amazing. I, I like that. When I grow up, I want to be just like you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you, and um, and I hope that your your initiative is extremely successful because it's thank going you. to change the world. Best Rosh Hashem. Best Rosh Hashem. And um, and thank you. We hope uh, everyone enjoyed this episode. And we'll catch you guys next time. Thanks for watching this episode of the Homebound Podcast. The purpose of this content is to teach and inspire Kal Yisrael about the holiness and importance of living in Eretz Yisrael. Some of our discussions are based off of our own opinions and understandings of the teachings of the Torah, but we are always looking for the truth. So if you disagree with anything we said or believe that something was misquoted, please feel free to email us. And if you value the content that we create, please consider donating or sponsoring one of our future videos as we can only continue to spread our message through your help. So please hit that like button and subscribe to our channel and visit us at our website at homeboundisrael.com to find more inspiration and information on the importance of living in Eretz Yisrael. And may we all merit to see the coming of Mashiach.